Good morning. Um, happy to be the first speaker today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a story, a story about mental health, uh, something about virtual reality, and maybe a little bit with artificial intelligence. Um, before I do that, let me talk a bit about the background. So it was sometimes in 2020, COVID started, work from home, everybody staying at home, it's, it was crazy. I'm quite sure that everybody can relate to that one. We all had been through this. Uh, I was that time doing my executive MBA thesis. Crazy, right? Working and then doing again a thesis. And I had to write a business plan for that one. I was wondering what to work on. Uh, one such evening, I was watching this particular movie. It's a Bollywood movie called Chinchore that translates into immature. This movie talks about a middle-aged man a successful one, and his son, who committed or tried to commit suicide, somehow survived. Now, the boy, who is not in this picture, of course, is not willing to fight for the life. He failed in one major exam, and he's scared. He's scared of being tagged as a loser in life. Then, the father invited some of his friends, friends from youth, friends from college, and they started talking about all those stories to the son all the stories of their success and their failure, try to explain the beauty of life. It's not always about success. We also care about the failure. That makes us perfect, or maybe not. But it's about enjoying the life. And eventually, he got well. It's a very nice movie, feel-good movie, especially during the time of COVID. Next morning, the very next morning, I was browsing news. I do that every day. My wife hates me for that. This breaking news popped up. This guy, the guy sitting in the middle, who acted as the father and tried to convince his son that committing suicide is not something you should do. You should enjoy your life. He himself committed suicide in later life. That was weird. It was a very weird feeling that I had and spooky. And then more and more news came. And apparently, this guy, he had issues with his mental health among other things as well, of course. And that moment, I thought, yeah, this is something maybe I can explore. I can try to explore a bit more into that one. And when I looked more, I found many in my circle, in my friends, in my families, many people are actually suffering from it. It's a huge number. Then I looked into some stats, and this is what I found. 38% of the EU citizens, which is more than one third, they're suffering from it. And when I looked into India, my country, more than 20% of the people in the population, they're suffering from it. And this number, it's actually pretty old. By old, I mean it's pre-COVID. So definitely post-COVID, these numbers are even higher. So it's a big issue. We all know that. So why don't we go for help? So I thought a little bit, and let's try to see if that makes sense. First thing, I feel that we are scared. We always fear that if we try to get help, we'll be tagged as a mentally sick person. We also lack insight. We think there is something wrong. No, nothing can go wrong with us, right? Or if something is wrong, it's not that serious. Plus, we also find it's very difficult to open up. I mean, we find it difficult to talk to a person whom we don't know about our personal problems. And honestly, there is not enough help as well. If you're looking for mental health support, it's not that much. Globally, I'm talking about. So I created a small survey. It's a QR code. So if you guys can or want, just scan this one. And there are three simple questions. And uh, yeah, it will give me some, some idea. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll give a little bit of time if you want to do that. And while you do that, uh, maybe. <laughs> Okay, I'll go to the next slide, where I ran this one on a bigger audience. And uh, these are the three questions you'll be seeing here. The first, 98% people think that mental health problem is a serious thing. And then 54% thinks, yeah, they have somewhat average mental health. And 14% thinks it's kind of poor. But interestingly, almost all of them never got diagnosed with it. Merely 14% had it. 
Is it surprising? I don't think so, right? Because the reason we told, people know that they might have problems, but yeah, we fail to look for help, we fail to seek help. Now let me quickly check if you managed to fill the survey and let me see if I got some responses already. Yeah, I already got quite a few. So here also, 98% thinks it's a serious problem. 73% people has average. 13% has poor. And 84% never got diagnosed. So similar picture. But as human beings, we are interesting. So we don't want to approach a therapist for help. But we like to try apps. We like to try apps even more in everything, right? Especially after COVID, we have used app much more than it used to be. So, probably mental health apps are pretty useful. And I tried to look into that one. There are quite a few of them, and the best ones, they have millions of downloads. I think five to 10 millions. It's good, it helps, but does it? But before that, I also tried to find what do people think about these apps? What makes a, a medical healthcare app a good one? So in the same survey, I asked these questions to people. And the first one actually talks about the people who will use this kind of app if recommended. And the second group, no. Even if doctor recommends, they are not willing to use these kind of things. And both of these group of people thinks it should be easy to use and data should be treated properly. Data confidentiality, security, yeah, it's sensitive data, right? It should be taken care of. So if an app works well, takes care of these issues, it's fine, but not really. It can't replace the therapy that you get in person in a clinic. How do we solve that with technology? I think one way of doing that would be virtual reality-based one. By the way, all these illustrations are done by me, just to avoid all these copyright issues. Um, so, VR is great, and they are immersive by nature. So if you put a headset properly with this app there, you can feel that you are in the system, in the environment. And if we can combine that with some games, the games that are good for treating mental health problems, that those games that evoke certain emotions, put some stimuli and gets you treated, that would work very well. And you can even have uh, mental health coaches through VR, and you can have the same experience as sitting almost, I would say exactly. And this is not new. This is already quite old, I would say. US government has been using this kind of technology since the 90s to treat soldiers suffering from mental trauma, PTSD kind of thing. Now, let's look a bit uh, into the flowchart that I think works for this kind of uh, platform or app. So there are two ways this, can, this flow uh, can start, right? So either you get recommended, but I'm not going to go into that direction. I'm thinking about a part where we are not confident to approach a psychiatrist, and we just want to try something by ourselves. So we feel low, we download this app, we found it's good, a good rating is there in the Play Store. We get a very cheap uh, VR device, something like a Google Cardboard maybe. We play our game, first game. Then we react in a certain way, and then the platform actually recommends you to visit a doctor. You can even do it online. There, are, there might be doctors in the platform itself. You get your first appointment, you start playing the games, then the doctors visualize how you're playing, how you're reacting, and then eventually you have more and more sessions and you, you should feel better. So that's great, right? It's a good app. It's not going to judge you. This app you can play within your comfort zone in the home. It's immersive game. So why is not that widely used? Why it's not widely adopted? So in the same survey, I asked people, what do they think about the issues in terms of difficulties in adopting VR? And these two stood out. It's expensive, and yeah, it's not easy to access. Uh, so I looked into some, some of the VR apps. Those are theirs to treat mental health care problem. And interestingly, all are from the Western world, countries in Europe, US, some in Australia, nothing for other countries. And these are also expensive here as well, so you either need a very good healthcare plan or you have to pay it from your own pocket. Now, if we think about a country like India, where the median salary is around 350 euros a month, it's not a practical solution. 
Let's look a bit into India. So these are the numbers, sad numbers. 56, 56 million people suffering from depression, 38 anxiety, and see the contribution in terms of suicides globally. And then in the next line, if you look into the number of support, that's hilarious. It's practically not existing. And when I asked people, people in my circle, what do they think about using these kind of things? Still, 51% of people think if it is an affordable one, if it is work, working, it, if it helps, they are willing to use it. So I think it is a possibility. There is a big gap. In India, we have 750 million smartphone users. It's a huge number. And definitely many of them have this mental health problem. So it's a big opportunity to work on. So if we can have a very affordable solution that is accessible, that gives you immersive experience, that's fun, yeah, people might want to try it. But we can make it even smarter. How? With AI. So I will give you a very simple example with this thing. It's called reinforcement learning, where the AI learns from the environment itself. So here, this is a cute robot, which is our AI. And it needs to choose between fire and water. It doesn't know anything, anything about either fire or water. First, it touches fire. Yeah, it burns its hands. It gets penalized. It learns, yeah, don't touch it. Then it goes to water. Touches it, yeah, I kind of feel nice. So at the end, it learns, yeah, you can touch water, but not fire. It becomes smarter. Now, how does it relate to us? Let's go back to the same flowchart that we had before. It's exactly the same, except the playing part. So you start using this one, uh, you buy a VR device, you make an appointment, you play the game recommended by the doctor. And now, when you start playing it, how you play, the app learns your pattern. The app learns how you are reacting, and then it's also adapting itself. So it becomes your game. It's not a common generic game. So the game keeps on evolving as you play. It's more engaging from you, for you, more fun for you. So you enjoy playing it. You get treated faster. It's more effective. And you start feeling better, and that's a faster process. And I believe this is the future of mental health. Um, so finally, just to, just to conclude, I talked about three things. Mental health problem. Mental health problem how can we treat it with, with VR, and how can we even improve it? I'm trying to build one myself. A apart from my, my full-time job, I'm trying to explore what can I do in this direction. And trust me, it's, it's not an easy job. It's a very difficult one. And in terms of usage as well, it's something I would say not easy to use as well. So people might have like a headache if wearing it for a long time. But what I think, the benefits are way more than the, the issues that we might have with fear. And I truly believe this is the future. Time is changing. All I can say is that, yeah, let's not be shy with our mental health problem. Let's be more open to these kind of technologies. Just one final thing while I'm developing, I'm still doing more survey like what kind of thing people want to use, their opinion. So if you can just maybe take a picture now, it, it's a bit bigger survey. Take a picture now and do it later. Yeah, that would really give me lots of insight. Thank you.